In 1933, more than a decade of American isolationism, pacifism, and non-interventionism has allowed other major powers to use a military power vacuum to reshape the status quo post-Great War. Because, you know, when the cat's away, the mice will dance on the tables. But no longer, it seems, as American President Roosevelt now puts American remilitarization back on the agenda. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately, humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. Though the fighting of World War I ended in 1918, the armament factories of the victorious belligerents did not stop working. While the German high seas fleet is scuttled, the US, Britain, France, Italy, and Japan are drawn into a naval arms race that risks shuffling the newly established power balance of the world. The US has planned to have 50 modern battleships by 1919, though this doesn't happen. Japan orders 16 new capital ships. Even Britain, already the owner of the world's most powerful fleet, keeps ordering new vessels. But the public has had enough of war, enough of the expenditure, and American public opinion heavily favors isolation. Moreover, many believe that it was the pre-World War I arms race that caused the conflict to escalate as it did. So new measures to prevent this from ever happening again are now in the making. So, in 1921, representatives from Britain, France, Japan, and Italy traveled to Washington to discuss global naval disarmament. President Warren G. Harding, who does see an arms race as one of the major causes of the World War, is afraid that American naval armament might not only strain U.S. resources, but will also lead to a future conflict with Japan or even Britain in the Pacific. The Washington Naval Conference puts these fears to rest. Under American pressure, the five powers agreed to limit the number of capital ships, battleships, battle cruisers, and aircraft carriers. The U.S. and Britain are allowed an equal amount of tonnage for their capital ships. Japan is entitled to a slightly smaller navy, the same as France and Italy. The amount of smaller vessels below 10,000 tons is unlimited, however. Any ships above the limit set are to be destroyed, and construction of new ships is to be halted. No new ships can be constructed for the next 10 years. Just to be safe, the US, Britain, and Japan also explicitly agree to leave the status quo in the Pacific as is. And with the stroke of a pen, or five pens, the anticipated naval arms race is neutralized. But the Navy isn't the only branch of the US military subject to change. The Army and National Guard are also reformed. The 1920 Defense Act moves away from maintaining a large standing army and towards a small defense force with the option of mass mobilization. The regular army and the National Guard are extended with a new branch, the Organized Reserves. The U.S. Army will be downsized to no more than 130,000 men in 1922. The Army will also be responsible, though, for training the National Guard and the organized reserves. American pacifist efforts increased throughout the 1920s. In 1928, President Calvin Coolidge signs the Kellogg-Briand Act in Paris, declaring a frank renunciation of war as an instrument of national policy. In other words, war is outlawed as a tool of geopolitics. 31 countries, including Germany and Japan, signed the pact before it goes into effect in 1929. Now, this treaty is revolutionary in its idealism, and the US negotiator, Secretary of State Frank Kellogg, will win the Nobel Peace Prize a year later. In 1930, the London Naval Treaty is signed, again restricting shipbuilding for the world's great powers and imposing strict regulations on submarine warfare, such as submarines' total displacement tonnage and gun sizes. And if you see it from a global conflict perspective and not just localized, the 1920s were a time of comparative peace, unquestionably in part because of naval treaties. So the US feels validated in its isolationist stance, and this continues into the 1930s. And as the Great Depression begins, American politics are focused ever more on domestic issues to repair the ailing economy. 
In Latin America, the Monroe Doctrine gives way to the 1933 good neighbor policy. The Monroe Doctrine, if you don't know, established in the 1820s, made the United States the protector of the Americas against European colonialism and anything that might interfere with U.S. interests in the Western Hemisphere. This has resulted in multiple interventions or even invasions of places like, like the Dominican Republic or Haiti. Following the good neighbor policy, though, the United States vows to no longer intervene in Latin American domestic issues. The rising tensions in Europe and Japan that follow the rise of new militarist governments causes Americans to become even more isolationist. America is not keen to enter yet another devastating war far from home. And when Japan invades Manchuria in 1931, the United States does little. President Herbert Hoover issues the Stimson Doctrine, which rejects recognition of any territory acquired by military force. This leaves Japan fairly unimpressed. Instead, it interprets this as the U.S. not willing to take its responsibility to protect the status quo in the Pacific. So instead of a threat, Japan sees an opportunity. This isolationist attitude has a significant effect on military spending and thus on the shape of the U.S. military in general. By the 1930s, the U.S. Army is still roughly the same size it was in 1922 and mostly using World War I era equipment and weapons. In general, the military is low on the political priority list. With public favor of a pacifist and isolationist foreign policy, the Army doesn't really enjoy tremendous public support. As a result, cut after cut in funding has left the Army, like the Navy, in a fairly dire state by the time Roosevelt takes office in 1933. But one of Roosevelt's first act is the foundation of the Civilian Construction Corps, CCC, designed to provide jobs to around 3 million unemployed American men between the ages of 18 and 25. The Army runs the CCC camps, though FDR publicly states this is not a military project. But the mobilization is carried out exceptionally quickly, which gives Army officers valuable experience in speedy mobilization. And such experience well, it could come in handy fairly soon, as some of the former signatories of the Washington Pact and the London Treaty refused to renew them. Since the signing of the Naval Treaties, the international political and economic landscape has changed. Under new fascist or militarist regimes, many countries begin beefing up their armies and expanding their navies. The US does little nearly nothing to intervene, but Roosevelt does grow increasingly worried as Japan begins commissioning new ships. This does challenge the status quo in the Pacific and threatens U.S. trade interests in the region. The fear is confirmed by the American ambassador to Japan, who telegraphs to Roosevelt that the Japanese fighting force considered the United States as their potential enemy because they think the U.S. is standing in the path of their nation's natural expansion. See, during the entire Hoover administration, 1929 to 1933, not a single ship, not even within the treaty allowances, had been commissioned. In 1934, the U.S. Navy has 372 ships. 288 of them, around three quarters, are in dire need of replacement. Many of them are World War I era destroyers that are, are no match for a modern naval vessel. And though Roosevelt might be worried, Congress refuses his proposals for naval rearmament. Many politicians are still advocating isolationism, and the budget is already seriously stretched because of the Depression. In 1934, Japan completes the first part of its naval rearmament program, the Circle Plan, activating 39 new warships. An additional 48 warships will be completed by 1937. To a lot of people, it is clear that Japan is preparing its navy not just for war, but for full control over the Pacific Ocean. During negotiations for a second London Naval Treaty, Japan bluntly walks out when the US and Britain are unwilling to allow Japan to have as many capital ships as they already have. Instead, the Japanese announced that by the end of 1936, when the Washington Naval Treaty expires, they are no longer bound by any naval treaty limiting their naval construction. The US, France and Britain do sign the Second London Naval Treaty in 1936. 
And this gives Japan a head start for some hypothetical arms race. But precisely for this reason, Roosevelt has no interest in upholding it. The treaty has a back door. So the US can increase its navy if Japan continues to threaten the status quo in the Pacific. Now, this is actually excellent PR for Roosevelt since to the public, he appears to be a front runner for naval limitations and an advocate for peace and non-interventionism, which becomes crucial as the 1936 elections come ever closer. But in reality, he has opened the door to rearmament. Roosevelt's ally, Carl Vinson, congressman from Georgia and rabid naval rearmament advocate since the 1920s, now asks Congress for a $3.3 billion public works program to fight unemployment. As soon as the bill is approved, Roosevelt slices $237 million off of it for construction of 30 new warships. The isolationist majority in Congress angrily denounce Roosevelt, but he simply replies that he's doing nothing but creating desperately needed jobs. Privately, Roosevelt sighs with relief and tells his Secretary of the Navy, Claude Swinson, Claude, we got away with murder that time. But don't think that most Americans are oblivious to any Japanese threat. In 1934, Vincent proposes a new Naval Act in Congress. This bill, dubbed the Vincent Trammell Naval Act, aims to gradually replace old ships and build new ones, but still within the restrictions of the Washington Naval Pact from the 1920s. 102 new vessels are to be built and commissioned over the next eight years. The idea is that when construction is complete, the US Navy would be able to withstand the Imperial Japanese Navy. But make no mistake, the US is nowhere near being the powerhouse that they would need to be to rule the waves. The first of their new capital ships will only finish production well into the second half of the 1930s, while Japan is already way ahead with its circle plan. As global tensions continue to rise, the army also gets funds to modernize and expand its numbers slightly, starting in 1935. Horses are replaced by motorized vehicles. New light M1 tanks and medium-sized M2 tanks are introduced and incorporated in the infantry. The Bolt Action M1903 Springfield rifles are replaced by semi-automatic M1 Garand rifles, a significant advantage over any other country still using Bolt Action rifles. Roosevelt bases his strategic doctrine on the Fortress America concept rather than a war overseas which he, and especially Congress, want to avoid at all costs. Some 50,000 men, a third of the army at this time, are deployed to coastal fortifications and artillery positions as a second line behind the US Atlantic Fleet, America's primary defense. In the Protective Mobilization Plan of 1937, the National Guard are to be incorporated into the army in the case of war, bringing effective wartime army personnel up to 400,000 men. Mass mobilization could potentially add millions to that number, of course. So here we are. As 1935 comes around, the US Army is growing and a naval arms race in the Pacific seems unavoidable. The Japanese are still working on their circle plan as the Americans try to catch up, but the Americans are late to the party and public opinion still heavily favors isolation, which begs the question, is it all too little too late? As the Second Sino-Japanese War breaks out in 1937, which we will cover in future Between Two Wars episode, an American gunboat, the USS Panay, is on patrol in the Yangtze River. 12 Japanese planes attack the boat, sinking it and causing 46 American casualties. Roosevelt and Congress are furious. Japan claims that the pilots didn't see the US flags on the gunboat. It was on unintentional and unexpected occurrence. The Japanese government and people wish to express their sincerest and profoundest regrets. They apologize, they pay an indemnity to the United States, but Roosevelt is far from satisfied, though he is held back by the non-interventionists. He can only issue a public condemnation of the Japanese. But this is a turning point. The Japanese are not playing games, and Roosevelt knows it. A second Vincent Trammell Act in 1938 aims to beef up the army by 
and the Two Ocean Navy Act creates plans that could increase the U.S. Navy by 70% by 1940. Yet at this time, it still seems unlikely that they will ever be used. The U.S. remains fiercely isolationist. In August 1935, Congress passes its first Neutrality Act, banning all export of arms and munitions to belligerent nations. Roosevelt is not in favor of this. See, this restricts him so he cannot aid friendly nations like France and Britain if they're in need. And he does consider vetoing it. But when Benito Mussolini and Italy invade Abyssinia, FDR wants to prevent Italy from getting American arms. So he signs the act after all. The law also specifies that U.S. citizens who are traveling to belligerent nations do so at their own risk, and they cannot expect the U.S. to intervene on their behalf. In early 1936, the act is renewed for another 14 months and expanded by banning loans and credit lines to belligerent nations. Later amendments even ban all American citizens from traveling on belligerent ships and forbid U.S. ships from transporting any arms whatsoever. There are some back doors, though, through which allied nations can be supported. Belligerent nations are allowed to buy American materials not considered to be an implement of war, like food and oil, provided they are exclusively using their own ships and pay with cash on pickup. This is clearly meant for Britain and France, who have the money and can safely cross the Atlantic whenever they like. This is the cash and carry system that I talked about on our World War II channel, and it at least gives Roosevelt some cards to play with. Now, with a clever maneuver, Roosevelt prevents Japan from using the cash and carry provision in the Second Sino-Japanese War, since Japan and China never declared war on each other. But this is considered partisan by FDR's political enemies, who fear that Roosevelt is taking sides in a foreign conflict with, with who knows what agenda. When the cash and carry provisions term expires in early 1939, Congress blocks its renewal, even after the German annexation of Czechoslovakia and the outbreak of World War II in September. It is not until November 1939, when American public opinion begins to sway towards the Allies, that FDR can renew and expand the cash and carry provision. From then on, cash and carry will include all materials, including the war materials that were not allowed under the Neutrality Acts of 1935 and the Cash and Carry Act of 1937. You could argue that American neutrality ended for all practical purposes in 1937 when cash and carry was introduced, designed by Roosevelt specifically to aid France and Britain. Roosevelt is beginning to pave the way for an American intervention on the Allied side in case of war. However, years of pacifism, isolationism, and non-interventionism have caused the U.S. Navy and Army to lag behind. Japan, Germany, and Italy already start remilitarizing in the early 1930s, and after Japan begins to wage war in 1931 and again in 1937, they find themselves virtually unopposed by other major powers. The Japanese horizon gradually expands, and new lands in the Pacific seem up for grabs. Who would even dare stop them? The U.S.? Well, the U.S. is not ready for that, and it will have to make a considerable effort if it will ever stand a chance of maintaining dominion of its Pacific interests. But in 1933, pretty much everyone feels that Japan is a land far, far, far away from any American harbor, right? If you'd like to know more about how the U.S. turned away from the world right after the First World War, check out our episode about U.S. isolationism right here any minute now. Our patron of the week is Torstein Fuchstad. That's an awesome name, actually, Torstein Fugstad. Be like Torstein and join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Subscribe, click the bell, and as... Okay, it was one of the Colberts. I don't know, I can't remember if it was American political pundit Stephen Colbert or uh, San Diego Padres 1970s first baseman Nate Colbert, who once said, if our founding fathers wanted us to care about the rest of the world, they wouldn't have declared their independence from it. Cheers. That's good stuff. Mm -hmm.